episode of the self development with tactics podcast today we once again going through a video not necessarily by andrew huberman but around andrew huberman and his research and um it is about stress it is about stress and the mind and it is actually uploaded from stanford and i'm going to show you where it is it is not on youtube um i mean <laughs> Technically, it is on YouTube, yes. But as... What the fuck? Uh, no. Don't want to have it this way. There we go. Um, technically, it is on YouTube, as you can see here. But um, indeed, it is on uh, engineering.stanford.edu. Apparently, there's also a podcast on that. Um i have had a quick look into it there are no timestamps, unfortunately which makes things definitely a bit um a bit more difficult to go through but can't i actually just open it there we go i'm just gonna open it on youtube i think if this is at least possible um yeah way better Thank you. Way, way, way better. Um, also because I can show... <laughs> I once again cannot show you when this was uploaded, but the title is Andrew Huberman, How Stress Affects the Mind and How to Relive It from Stanford University School of Engineering. Why engineering? I don't fucking know. But we're gonna maybe find out and see, but um, maybe also not. Who the fuck knows? So yeah, let's have a look. Today on The Future of Everything, The Future of Stress and Your Mind. Well, 2020 has been without a doubt one of the most stressful periods for humanity in, in any kind of recent memory. We've had COVID-19, we've had social unrest, we've had political discord, economic tumult. Health, safety, security risks immediately impacting millions of people. And guess what? This leads to stress. There are many ways to experience stress and it impacts all your senses, hearing, touch, smell, and most definitely vision. Ever since humans were living- And this is where Andrew Huberman comes into place. When it's about vision, I think, I don't know if he's specialized in vision. I really don't, but I know that he knows quite a lot about vision. And this, well, you know what it is about sunlight exposure and, um, so on and so forth <laughs> many ideas it's actually really interesting what he has to say about about vision in general and um and how it affects and it is also something i've been talking about yesterday partly um it is very interesting to see how vision and um you know maybe uh, things that that just have to do with the eyes and he's going to talk about that in in a very short um period of time no uh how it affects the the whole body it is really interesting but yeah anyway in small bands combating predators and running away from them they have developed a keen sense of their environment that's why we have our senses it was critical for their survival to perceive threats and respond now this innate wired system for sensing threats and responding remains even as our need to combat predators on a daily basis is reduced. You know, I've been sitting at the same desk for six months now and there's just not been a lot of predators. And I've been sitting all fucking day long trying to do some work and doing the work and now my back hurts. At this point in time, uh, I don't know, I think I'm getting old, I'm 21 now, but I feel really fucking old at this point. I mean, back in the days, I, I was able to just sit around all fucking day long and nothing happened. But these days it's like, okay, you know, my back starts hurting. I need to get up, I need to to, to go around and whatnot. Um, maybe it's my scoliosis, but but I don't know. Like, it's, it's not great. Nonetheless, uh, these sens sensory systems, in particular the visual system, plays a huge role in our perception of the world, how we process it, and ultimately how our minds and our bodies determine the levels of anxiety versus calm that's, that is appropriate for us. 
Professor Andrew Huberman is a professor of neurobiology and ophthalmology at Stanford University. He studies how the brain works, how it can be repaired, and has a special focus on the visual system. He has studied how the visual system recognizes stressful or threatening situations, and how the brain then goes on to process these signals and figure out how to respond. Andrew, I think most of us can understand how a visual threat like a lion running at us would be triggered by our visual system and lead to a response. But you have found that the vision system may be involved in much more subtle ways in detecting and responding to situations that are perhaps much less uh, immediately dangerous. Can you tell me about that? And thanks for being here. Well, delighted to be here. The visual system is really interesting in terms of the senses and how it interacts with the, st the thing that we call stress. Um, I should just, right off the bat, I should mention that, you know, the distinction between stress, anxiety, fear, and trauma there's a lot of overlap between those. Uh, yes. So just to define our terms, uh, you know, you can't have fear without stress and anxiety, but you can have anxiety and stress without fear. Uh, you don't necessarily have trauma. So I'm going to refer to stress as a sort of catch-all for daily stress, long-term stress, short stress. I'll try and uh, distinguish between the various uh, types of stress as we go forward, but just to make that clear at the outset. Great, yes. Um, to avoid any confusion. So a couple things about the visual system. We all think about vision as foreseeing, and of course we see with our eyes, um, but we forget often that the eyes, in particular the neural retina, which is these three thin, three layers of cells at the back of the eye, are actually part of the brain. They're and this is what I meant before. Like, uh, it is incredible to see that vision, the eyes, and so on and forth. So forth, so quite everything is <clears throat> has something to do with the eyes. Um, apparently, really does change or has something to do with the brain, just because it is part of the brain, which I just didn't know. I didn't know before Andrew was was talking about it that <clears throat> that it is the case, and uh, it's very interesting. It really is, and um, it might just also. It might just also change things for you in a way like when one is not feeling that great, maybe one can change one's feelings by, um, I don't want to say stimulating, but I think it, it goes into a more correct direction by stimulating what the eyes are seeing. So maybe when I'm really stressed, having a look at something green, um, in general colors, colors that are calming, um, maybe closing my eyes, maybe, uh, I think that there are many things that one could be doing to maybe get out of the stress and, um, or get away from the stress, work through the stress, um, by maybe working with the eyes or with the body. So the whole body and, and mind, body, quote unquote, soul, maybe also just eyes, but yeah. They're the only part of the brain that's outside the skull. They're, they're literally part of the central nervous system. And there's a genetic program that pushed them out of the skull around, around the end of the first trimester of life. And you might ask, well, why would the brain put a piece of itself outside the skull? And it's because by being able to look at light energy photons from afar, we place our whole body, because our brain and nervous system control our body, in a much better position to respond to things in our environment without having to interact with them directly through touch. Other animals are more dependent on smell. Humans are very strongly visual dependent. Now we also do this with our hearing, of course, but vision is the dominant sense that humans use to navigate the world and survive. And there are very interesting interactions between how we see and how we feel internally, stress, and as well as how stress impacts the visual system. So it's bi-directional. So for instance, let's say I'm uh, you know, moving through my morning and I make a cup of coffee and then all of a sudden, I hear something on the radio or I look at my phone and I get a troubling text message, something really alarming to me. It could be about a family member, it could be about a world event. The stress Plenty response- of these in the last seven months. Right, I think we're all familiar with getting these on a daily basis, many times per, uh, per day. All of a sudden, my, everything has changed. And we normally think of the heart rate quickens, breathing quickens, we perspire, you know, the stress response, the so-called fight or flight response. But one of the most powerful things that happens to us that we don't realize because it happens subconsciously is our pupils dilate and there's actually a change in the optics of the eye, movement of the lens and so forth, that brings that text message or that thing that we're even hearing 
it brings it into sharper relief. We see it more clearly and everything else kind of fades away. And it's not a, a purely cognitive thing. This is actually like changing your phone's camera to portrait mode if you've right. ever taken it. Right. Which might underline something that I have pointed out before, I think plenty of times, but still uh, it's it's it doesn't make too much sense for me. So <clears throat> when the pupil is dilated, because he said it is dilated and everything else kind of you know, it goes away. It's like a vignette effect. Um, it's not the pupil being really small when you're focused or when we are focused, also when we're reading something and whatever. Um, apparently, it is when our pupils are dilated. Might mean something to you. I don't know. But it's very interesting because I always thought like, okay, when I'm having really fucking small pupils, then I'm having like the fucking eagle eye mode on. But it's not the case. Right. Portrait mode. One thing is in very bold relief and everything else is kind of blurry in the background. So let me that's ask you. Yeah, will, will so that's that what happens to our vision. Will that response happen even if the initial insult was not through the visual system? So I'm, what I'm asking is, I get a text. That's a fundamentally visual experience. But I hear something on the radio that's equally that's stressful. Question. Am I still going to get that visual change? Yes. And it's because the stress response deploys a huge number of things in the brain and body. I won't list them all, but um, just to kind of capture the essence of it, there are two signals that run in parallel for the aficionados, one from the hypothalamus, one from the amygdala. Parts of the brain. Parts of the brain um, that to a set of neurons that runs from about your clavicles down to your belly button. And all those neurons deploy neurotransmitter, they dump chemicals into the body all at once. Actually, the reason this system is called the sympathetic nervous system is not because it makes you feel sympathetic in the emotional sense. It's because sympa means together. And all of those neurons act together as a chain. And they deploy these chemicals into the body. The adrenal glands, which sit right above your kidneys in your lower back, they deploy adrenaline, also called epinephrine. Your brainstem deploys epinephrine. And all of that epinephrine and acetylcholine and other things create these responses in the body like the quickened heart rate and breathing, et cetera, and the dilation of the pupils and the change of the optics, all subconsciously and all within 500 milliseconds, half a second. Okay. Meaning it's going to be very hard to prevent the stress response from happening. And as we go along, we could talk about some of the tools perhaps that my lab and other labs are developing to learn to push back on the stress response almost as quickly as it engages. But I mention that because I think a lot of people feel this kind of what I call meta stress. They feel stressed that they're stressed and they feel like, oh, well, I'm doing my meditation and I'm sleeping well, I'm eating well. And you know, why am I so stressed? Well, you're stressed because this system was designed to be very fast, half a second, recruit almost all of your being, mind, body, eyes, everything. And fundamentally, it was designed to agitate you so that you move. It was designed to move you from one location to another. Physic Which is a very good thing. You know, it's basically uh, preventing very bad things from happening theoretically. And as I'm thinking about it, it might not be necessarily about um, preventing the stress response to, to happen when it is um, about this, this meta stress, you know, when I'm feeling stressed because I am stressed. It might not actually be about this fact but it might just be about you know why why am i being stressed now and so when i'm feeling this stress response trying to figure that out and trying to to see that maybe probably and um i think one then can can work on it i mean as as i'm thinking about it i don't know maybe i uh, i'm about to give a presentation um it's a bit stressed i'm nervous and, and whatnot it makes sense doesn't it uh and um even though i mean <laughs> someone meditates someone someone sleeps well and then whatever uh, i know where he's getting at or, or what he is getting at but um I don't know, I would say that a bit of a too too sensitive uh, stress system, let's call it like this, um, might be ju might just be better than, than one that just does not activate. And uh, um, even though uh, I fortunately think that there are not too many things that we have to be that afraid of, like there are no predators anymore, at least not, not in the sense that... Uh, you know, it, it has been before, 
but um yes very it um i think why am i stressed once again getting back to and i i, <laughs> I kind of feel like a parrot at this point but um, more questions, more questions for oneself and trying to just understand things instead of instead of judging oneself, instead of just, you know, you know, always seeing things as a negative. I kind of think that or feel like that this is or might be a very, a very quick, maybe even the first response that a lot of people are having, like, okay, um, this is bad, I shouldn't be doing this, that, and the other thing, I shouldn't be feeling this, that, and the other thing. And so what is going on with me? What is wrong with me? But, you know, what about asking more questions? What about asking myself, why am I feeling this way? And maybe, and this sounds a bit, a bit like woo-woo, talking myself out of it to some degree, I guess, I think, by just realizing that there's maybe not necessarily something to be worried about or stressed about, and, you know, in this sense, re reframing things. But something that I also uh, had in mind just now is when I know that my, my pupils are being dilated, when I'm getting focused, you know, when I'm just seeing things sharper and when I'm, you know, kind of blending everything out, like I'm not seeing too much this vignette effect or vignette, I actually don't know. Um, Andrew Huberman was also talking about uh, purposefully restricting yourself from seeing too much, like when I'm having, for example, where is it? When I'm having a cap on, I don't see that much. I don't see everything that is above there. So that's good, maybe. Maybe it also helps with stress. I don't know. Maybe what might help with stress is um, getting more focus uh, or just, you know, getting more things into focus. So, for example, I don't know, like not having a fucking hat on because I then see more and not being that focused. So what I'm willing to say is, you know, maybe we can reverse engineer that. And this might actually be the point of his lab and, and somebody else's lab. But yeah. Let's move on. Physical movement, like let's run, let's let's uh, reposition. So, so that's interesting because you you made a comment a moment ago that indicated that these responses may not be the best thing for you to to ha be having. On the other hand, it's what it's how we've evolved and it's part of our system. So, tell me, how should I think about uh, this? You've uh, uh, described this great sympathetic reaction. I get my text message. Is that reaction going to help me do a better job at triaging whatever the situation is that I just heard about, or is it actually? more of a hindrance to the um, appropriate response and something that I need to combat. You, you kind of made a reference that we might want to like suppress it or combat it. And I was wondering, well, maybe this is part of how I'm going to have a good successful day dealing with life. Yeah. Um, great questions. So the stress response was, first of all, was designed to be generic. We often hear, oh, you know, this was designed to keep us safe from large predators. And it was, but it was also designed to allow us to process information of any kind very quickly to bring our focus to that information and deal with it. So the, the way- Apparently very important things, I would say. I mean, at least for our brains, our brain thinks that this particular thing is very important. And, and I mean, by doing so, just by doing so, just by trying to reframe things, just by trying to get your brain to understand that it is not something interesting, not something important, not something to, to be stressed about, um, might be a good thing to do. Ways in which right stress way. serves us adaptively is two ways. First of all, this change in the optics of the eyes, and it also even happens with our hearing. We sort of uh, get a tunnel vision. We also get tunnel hearing for the thing that is most important. The All of that was designed to do a couple things, but one of the more interesting ones that isn't discussed very often is the relationship to how we process time. What happens when that stress re response occurs is that we start fine slicing time. So as if we have a metronome inside of us that's, that normally if we're very relaxed is going tick, talk, tick, 
talk, but all of a sudden it's more units per unit time for overall unit time. So t- yes, t- and t- people have described t- this like time slowed down or stuff like that. Yes, or time so sped the, up. Right. So and then we can get right to that because I think it's one of the more interesting features. But um, I'll just say that it's a three things happen that are very useful about when stress occurs. First of all, we start slicing time more finely which as, as I'll describe in a moment, gives you more control over your external environment, not less. Second of all, and a lot of people don't know this, but the stress response deploys the immune response. In the short term, nerve fibers that connect to the organs of the body that... Might be one of the reasons why in very stressful times when we are just having to, to get something done, whether we are uh, learning for an exam and, and whatever, we do not tend to get ill afterwards maybe you know because everything shuts down again and everything goes back to quote unquote normal again um but during this time it is not quite the case so very interesting you know interesting to to see and and then also understand that that um stress being definitely demonized and also seeing or, or just you know getting to know the other side of the coin that it also has some some useful nest to it and there's a reason why we're having it so i don't know i i think like why should i demonize anything that my body does period i mean of course there's like allergies and whatnot which is just basically my body fighting itself or fighting things that actually are not that bad but um but still i mean there probably is a reason why things happen which is often very interesting. Deploy killer cells. Those liberate killer cells to combat infections. And so we always think about how stress makes us sick. Actually, if you've ever worked for a long period of time or studied for finals or taking care of a loved one, go, 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 and then you rest. It's during the immediate rest that you crash. And it's because the sympathetic nervous system also controls the immune response. It actually makes you less susceptible. Um, Wim Hof and the Wim Hof method does um, and I think this is the point of it. It does um, create a stressful environment for yourself by hyperventilating, um, also called tumor breathing, as far as I remember. And um, this is, I think, basically the reason why it works, because you're um, generating, quote unquote, adrenaline, and you're in a very stressful state. And, you know, therefore those killer cells, or um, however it was uh, called now, um, happens and why it might help with whatever you're having to deal with to bacterial and viral infections in the short term in the long term once the system moves from the acute stress response of adrenaline to more of a cortisol response which kind of sits in the deep layers of the of the adrenals and that's when you start running into immune compromised situations so it helps us in the short term and the third thing that it does is it really heightens all our senses it really, you know, the whole prick up, uh, prick up our ears kind of thing. It really allows us to process information, not just more finely in time, but also in space. And so that's powerful. Now, yes. the what you mentioned in terms of time slows down, there's a theory out there, and my lab's studying this, and so this is still preliminary, but it makes a lot of sense that if our internal metronome, our level of stress is high, and the external world um, let's say you're in line at the airport. Well, we used to go to airports, but something is, those. Uh, so you're late for your plane or for to pick up your child or a spouse or something like that. And you're, you're stressed. It seems like things outside you are moving more slowly. And it's because your internal metronome is not matched by your perception of what's happening in the outside world. That's why we believe, and this is work that I'm doing with David Spiegel's lab in psychiatry as well. Uh, we believe that the perception, for instance, in extreme traumas, extreme stress, that time slows down, like in a car crash, and you actually see events moving very slowly is because your internal metronome, the stress response is so high that everything outside you perceptually seems to be moving more slowly. You're, yeah, it's like you're, you're getting more frames per second, and it's like super slow-mo. Right. And when we hear slow-mo, we think of longer time bigs, but yeah. as you said, it's more frames per second. Take the opposite, which is the kind of um, more chronic stress response when we're overwhelmed and exhausted. We get up, we look at our phone, we sit, and the world just seems like it's going extremely fast. And that's because our internal state has isn't matched to that. I always say, you know, I'm a pretty high energy guy. I love New York City. 
I get off the subway in New York City and I feel like finally calm because I feel like the, the pace of things yes. around me is finally matched to the, um, the chaos in my mind. If I, in my, some of you may be able to relate to this, some of you more mellow types might feel like, why is everybody rushing about? You know, what's the, right. what's the hurry? Right. So I, we all have differences in our kind of baseline, what's called autonomic arousal. And that brings me to the other side of the coin with stress, which is, I believe in a lot of the effort of my lab is focused around how to teach people, well, first to discover tools, but how to teach people to recognize that this system that we call the autonomic nervous system, the one that brings us from sympathetic arousal of stress to what's called parasympathetic, which is really just because the neurons that control it are in the neck and in the pelvis, they are para around the sympathetic chain neurons. Yeah. So the parasympathetic neurons are associated with rest and digest. And typically the way people calm themselves with these uh, is, well, first of all, it's never autonomic because it's just very indirect. The most common way that we've learned to turn off the stress response, but is very slow, is to ingest food, carbohydrates in particular. The distension of the belly because of the vagus nerve is a big, uh, the 10th cranial nerve called the vagus nerve is a big part of this. When our belly is distended, it sends a signal to the brain that counters the stress response. And this is the, the essence of the parasympathetic response. Now, the fact... I tend to write exams when possible on an empty stomach. What I'm just now thinking about is, am I subconsciously doing that because I am definitely being maybe more stressed? I'm not having, uh, uh, probably among other things, I mean, <laughs> might just not only be this thing. I mean, uh, food and, and ingestion and, and having a full tummy, maybe even too full of a tummy or gut might just have completely and probably does have completely different effects on one and one's brain uh, performance, mental performance in general. But still, you know, maybe this is the case, like uh, me then having more focus, me then or just being more stressed, therefore having more focus, therefore seemingly I am having more time and so on and so forth. I mean, could be the case, you know, could work. I don't know. I. Um, in the end, and this is something Seth Godin said, if it is a uh, placebo, we just take the placebo, period. I mean, if it works because it works because of science, you know, because it, or science says that it works, or it's just a placebo for me, who really cares? You know, it is working for one, maybe for you, maybe for somebody else. And so why shouldn't I take it? You know, why shouldn't I take this free Thing, this free gift just you know using the placebo the fact that food can do that or for instance slowing our breathing just merely shifting to nasal breathing slowing our breathing there's a beautiful book that was written by our colleagues Paul Ehrlich Sandra Kahn called Jaws um, which is really about the benefits of nasal breathing versus mouth breathing the the introduction was written by another colleague Bob Sapolsky when we shift to nasal breathing and we slow our breathing, we naturally engage the parasympathetic response because of the way that the diaphragm, this muscle in our body, is linked to some of the other circuitry yeah. in the brain that controls stress. So all of this is to say that the stress response is good. It allows us to react. It liberates the immune system. It, it does all these things in the short term. But I think everybody, starting from a very young age and until really until our last days of life, could benefit from having tools that allow us to push back on that stress response when we're not able to process information in the way that is most adaptive, whatever that situation is. This is the future of everything. I'm Russ Altman. I'm speaking with Professor Andrew Huberman about our uh, stress responses and ways that we can learn to modulate it. And I did want to get into two, two ideas, um, both really compelling, but you have started to deploy uh, interesting technologies, I think, in pursuit of these ideas of training people to kind of um, sense their, their levels of stress or not stress and, and adjust them. Uh, and can you tell us about some of the more kind of avant-garde technologies that you guys are using? Sure. So my lab, we work on mice and we do studies on mice and we try and identify brain areas that are involved in the kind of things that I've been talking about up until now. We also have a human lab. And I should mention that the work that I'm about to describe is done in close collaboration with David Spiegel, who's the associate chair of psychiatry at Stanford, world expert. in. We are halfway through this video. I think that I'll have to split it down into two parts. I'm probably going to upload the, the other part tomorrow and or I'm going to record the other part tomorrow. I think up to this point, it might have been 
or is at least for me, if it has been a very good information, very interesting information, very, um, you know, very good insights and uh, into, I mean, how one could, could be dealing with stress and, you know, maybe uh, things I could be researching or you could be researching. Like, um, I like the idea of shining a spotlight on certain ideas, certain fragments even, um, so that someone else or myself uh, then can do a bit of research on that or maybe get interested in that, you know, see or, or have another life passion, whatever it might be. Um, I think more, even if it is not a good idea, even if it is not a good fragment, but a lot of fragments enable you as a listener, as a watcher to, um, you know, get more insights, you know, even if it may not necessarily be true, but looking that up, you know, what does this then lead to and what does this then lead to and so on and so forth. I think that it is amazing. Anyway, uh, I really hope that I've been able to spot, to, to spotlight some ideas or sh shine some light on certain ideas. And I'm hopefully going to see you the next time. So see you soon. Bye-bye.